In module 6, we will take a look at sequential CMOS circuits and how they can be integrated with combinational CMOS to form synchronous pipelines. First, we have to distinguish between combinational circuits and sequential circuits. So far, we have dealt with combinational circuits. The definition of a combinational circuit is a circuit whose output F is a function of its inputs and only its inputs. So the function is, the output is a function, a combinational function, a combination of the inputs. It is a Boolean combination of the inputs, and that's it. So if we have logic inputs, if any of the logic inputs change, generally the output will change. It will not change instantaneously, it will take a propagation delay to change. But we assume that any input change will lead to an output change. The amount of time that um, uh, separates the change in the input from the change in the output will vary depending on which input combination has caused the change, but we will always see a change in response and change in the output in response to a change in the inputs. A change in the output is unconditional and will always happen, and this is what defines a combinational circuit. This is as opposed to a sequential circuit. A sequential circuit does not always observe an output that is a function of inputs. The sequential circuit has an output that is sometimes the value of the input and at other times it is a value that is stored, it is an old value. And therefore, we need a signal to tell us whether the output is following the input or is a combination of the input or whether the output is preserving an old value. And this control signal that switches or multiplexes between these two modes for the output is called the clock signal. So why is a sequential element called sequential? So let's look at um, a, a very common piece of code that is used to exchange the values in two variables or two registers A and B. So let's assume we want to exchange the values contained in A and B. What we do is that we first use an intermediate uh, register or an intermediate variable, and we put the value of A in the intermediate variable T, and then we assign the value of, uh, of, a, of B to A, and then we assign the value of T to B. So this way we have exchanged the values contained in A and B. Now imagine that this piece of code, which is the variable swap code, which is a very well known uh, piece of code, actually describes hardware connections. So let's imagine that A, B and T are nodes, electrical nodes in a circuit, rather than registers or variables. They are actual hardware nodes. Then these three statements describe, the, uh, describe connections between these, two, uh, between these three nodes. So the first statement connects node A to node T, the second statement connects node A to node B, and the third statement is actually redundant because all it does is connect uh, node T to node B, which are already connected through node A. So if this was a description of, of hardware connections, it will not achieve variable exchange or variable swap. What it will do is that it will short circuit the three nodes to each other, ensuring that all three of them have the same value at all times. But in order for this to perform variable swap, in order for this to exchange the values in A and B, we have to have an intermediate storage element called T in which to temporarily store uh, the value of A. Another thing is that for variable swap to happen, we have to execute these three statements in order. If these three statements describe hardware connections, then the order in which they are uh, stated does not matter. It is just connections. There is no significance to the order. But for them to execute variable swap, the order has to be observed. So this has to be statement number one. This has to be statement number two. And this has to be statement number three. If you exchange any of these two statements, if they exchange their order, then a variable swap will not be achieved. So we find that to perform variable swap, we have to have an intermediate storage for the value t. So there has to be storage. 
And storage immediately tells us that we have memory. And we find that having memory or storage is necessary to perform a sequence of operations. So if we need sequencing, if we need something that follows a certain order, we cannot use combinational circuits. We have to use sequential circuits. And they are called sequential because they allow us to perform a sequence of operations. A sequential element will, by necessity, have memory because this is what allows us to perform a sequence. Memory that stores intermediate results. And having a memory, by necessity, suggests that we have a control signal to distinguish between storing mode and transparent mode. This control signal is called the clock. Now we have to think about what storage mechanisms we have available that allow us to realize memories so that we can form sequential elements. There is a storage element, a storage mechanism that we considered in module five, which was a capacitor with open circuits in all directions. So storing on the high impedance node is a valid method of storage. The capacitance will keep the value whether it's VDD or zero volt, we keep its value um, indefinitely as long as there are perfect open circuits in all directions. This method of storage is called dynamic storage, and it will lead us down the path of dynamic latches and dynamic registers, which are valid storage elements that will be very important. But we have to have a static counterpart. We have to have a static storage mechanism because we know that dynamic storage mechanisms are um, not very robust. They are susceptible to leakage, to charge sharing, to all the signal integrity issues that affect dynamic logic. So we have to find a static storage mechanism. Now consider this circuit, okay? We don't even have to use an AND, we can use just an AND gate. So we have an AND gate and the input to the AND gate is variable X and variable X bar. So they are a variable and it's complement. Uh, strictly speaking, we should think of the output of the NAND, of the AND gate as always null because um, we just have uh, zero inputs all the time. However, um, let's consider this step, like when, the, when X makes a positive step, and let's consider the fact that X bar is the complement of X, but through an inverter. And so the inverter has some delay, and X bar takes some time for its output to, uh, to drop down to zero. And so there is an interval of time during which both X and X bar are one, allowing us to produce an F, an output from the circuit that is an impulse um, of one. And the duration of this impulse is the delay of the inverter. And it is not produced immediately after uh, X bar uh, after X rises, but takes some delay, and this is the delay of the AND gate. Now, this kind of circuit is called a monostable circuit because it has one stable state. F has one stable state, which is zero. F can take the value of one, but when it does take the value of one, it can only remain there for a finite period of time equal to delta inverter. It will always go back to its stable state which is null, which is zero. So node F is not suitable for storage. It's not a suitable memory uh, location because it cannot support an indefinite um, storage of either zero or one. It can only remain stable at zero. Now let's consider uh, the situation where we have three inverters or any odd number of inverters connected in feedback. Now, if there is a zero at the output of the third inverter, this zero will pass through the first inverter producing a one, through the second inverter producing a zero, and this zero will produce a one at the output of the first inverter. And so if you look at node F, which is the output of the first inverter, so node F will remain at zero and then will rise back up to one after three inverter delays. So this is three delta inverter. But this one will also travel through the three inverters, updating to zero and updating this node to one and updating F back to zero. So in another three delta inverter, it will go back down to zero. 
and the zero travel again and update back to one and so forth. And so we find that node F, in fact, any node in this circuit is going to be oscillating. It's going to be an oscillator. It's going to produce a square wave whose period is six delta inverter. And we have the same situation with any connection of an odd number of inverters in feedback. Now, um, node F is not suitable as a storage node either, because node F cannot support either 1 or 0 in a steady state. In fact, we call node F an A-stable node. It is completely unstable. It can never remain at 0, can never remain at 1. It will always switch from 0 or 1 to the other state, which is why it oscillates. So it is not a st suitable storage node. Now, let's look at two inverters connected in feedback, or actually any even number of inverters. Let's look at node F. If node F contains a value of 0, this 0 will travel through the first inverter, producing a 1 at the input of the second inverter. This 1 at the input of the second inverter reinforces the 0 at the output of the second inverter. And so node F can remain at 0 indefinitely. Node F can also remain at 1 indefinitely. And not only can it remain at 0 or 1, it is a regenerative 0 or 1. If there is any noise that adds some voltage to uh, the 0 volt at node F, the first inverter will take care of that and will return it back to 0 through the pull-down path. And so this is an active and regenerative storage. It is a static storage. And we call node F a bistable node because it has two possible stable states, 0 and 1. And therefore, node F is perfectly suitable for storage. And this storage mechanism is our storage mechanism of choice for static memories.